Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Risks of Aging in 2021 virtual webinar, Cognitive Impairment and Long-Term Care, What You Need to Know and How to Pay for It, with Kristen Wilson, the co-owner and physical therapist at Action, One, Action Potential 101 Therapy, and with elder care attorney Robert Slutsky. Robert Slutsky has been practicing elder law for almost three decades. We have an office, Slutsky Elder Law, which is located in Plymouth Meeting. We have one in Radnor and we have one in Malvern. We are doing video consultations, kind of like we are right now on Zoom. So you'll be really familiar with it if you're interested in meeting with us. And we are doing phone consultations as always. Rob can give you a little bit more information about his background as well. And Kristen Wilson, she has an office in, or um, a, a location in Chadsford, as well as Glenn Mills. Yes, thank you very much, Heather. And, um, you know, we're really thrilled to have everyone joining us today. We know we have some great friends with us from a variety of different 55 plus communities, as well as just from general community in our area. And this is a topic that Rob and I have presented on very successfully before and felt like it was something we really wanted to extend to more people because the topic is really applicable regardless of what point of your own life cycle you're in. So if you're nearing your later years and you're starting to think about planning for the next phase, this is a fantastic webinar to help provide some of that information. But also maybe you are at the age where you're caring for your aging parents. Um, and this will help to give you some really tangible information to help you determine, hey, what are the next steps? What do I need to be prepared for? And how can I minimize any kind of issues for my parents' care as they continue to age? So I think that this uh, presentation really spans the age continuum, um, addressing both our middle age folks, our later year folks, and then certainly our significantly later year folks that might be looking at making some of these changes in the near future. Um, as we go through the presentation today, you're welcome to type any questions into the chat box. We're going to address all of the questions towards the end of the webinar. Um, and I do want to highlight um, that on the very last page of the webinar is um, some contact information for both Rob and myself in the event that you have additional questions afterwards. Certainly, uh, this is not any kind of a sales pitch. It's an information uh, exchange for you, but we do want to make ourselves available because we very strongly feel that access to knowledge is really the key to success. So please use us as resources moving forward. Um, in today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about cognitive impairment. Rob's going to touch on how this affects our older adults and why we need to be really mindful of this, whether it's something that you may be addressing yourself or maybe in your aging parent or other family members. Um, and then we'll talk about what are those criteria for determining when it's safe to stay in home. Uh, Rob's going to then talk about POA and guardianship and identify, you know, what the choices are that you have so that you can set up the best plan for you and your loved ones. We'll talk about some really evident signs that someone should not live independently. So maybe you're on the fence of like, oh, I don't know if mom and dad are okay to stay by themselves. These will be some really tangible signs that you can kind of do use as a checklist to see. Uh, Rob's going to talk about how to pay for long-term care options. Certainly, everybody has concerns about that because of the hefty price tag. And then lastly, I'll touch base on how do we prevent falls in the home, whether for yourself or your loved ones, uh, because we do know that falls are one of the key characteristics that lead towards the need for additional care with aging. So with that, I will turn it over to Rob, and he can start our presentation off on the right energetic foot. Okay, well... It's hard to be energetic on a screen like this, but I'll do my best. Um, good morning, everybody. So my background is I'm an elder law attorney. I've been doing it for 20, 28 plus years at this point. And so um, I am a private practice attorney, but a lot of my guidance, a lot of my practice is guided by the fact that for 21 years, I've represented the Montgomery County Area Agency on Aging, which is the third largest county area agency on aging in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So I have had the blessing of learning from the caseworkers there. And uh, so I might take a little different tact um, than, than many elder law attorneys because I have a lot of background in cognitive impairment and other things that some elder law attorneys do not address. You know, most of what you see with elder law attorneys is the concept of asset protection and Medicaid planning. And while that is a very important and necessary part of my practice, 
I deal with a lot of other items. Today, normally, I, you know, if I'm having a conversation in a, in a forum like this, I'm going to have a lot more time to discuss topics and to be a lot more broad. Today, it's going to be a few minutes on each topic and then questions at the end. So please understand that you're not getting the full picture, but you're getting some highlights that are important. Cognitive impairment in practical terms. Most people see cognitive impairment in an older adult, although older is a relative term. Um, it usually starts as some sort of memory loss. People uh, forgetting things, asking the same questions over and over. And I would tend to think about it in kind of three quick um, ways when thinking about cognitive impairment. Do, first is someone has memory loss, but they have insight into the memory loss. They recognize it, they acknowledge it, they either seek for help or find another way to compensate. So it's not really putting them in an unsafe situation. Um, then we have memory loss where we're seeing some functional difficulties where the, the, the memory loss itself is, for, is creating some sort of risk factor. The, the, the inability to manage medications, forgetting to eat at normal times and in normal ways, sundowning. But again, sometimes this is combined with someone who gets it. They have the insight, they see what's happening. The third thing, which is where intervention is generally gonna be needed, is where we have a person who is showing signs of cognitive impairment and whether it's memory loss or whether it's poor judgment. One of the things that uh, you probably have heard about or seen on TV um, is you know, when older adults become financially exploited, they get a call or they go onto a website and suddenly they are manipulated by someone into sending large amounts of money for no good reason uh, to a stranger, often you know, in, in another state or another country. And this happens often at the very, very beginning of the cognitive impairment process so that you might not notice that mom or dad is having these functional difficulties and they might go to the doctor and eat properly and take their medication. And yet they're very susceptible to this type of exploitation. And this is where we tend to see it because when people get more impaired, they, they either recognize it or they are more paranoid and more and less likely to be able to functionally become exploited because they don't have the ability to actually send out that big check because they're, they're losing that ability in general. So the, the, the thing where intervention is needed is not necessarily where there's impairment, but where there's impairment combined with someone who doesn't get that they're impaired or doesn't have a resource to lean on or refuses to recognize that that resource is there and lean on them, or when they're doing things that become uh, unsafe, whether it's physically or uh, financially. Great, and really, you know, Rob's point is such a valid one. We have to have a good understanding, uh, both within ourselves and our loved ones, of how the um, cognitive impairment affects their ability to maintain all of the safe activities that you need to do to be able to run a household. And so as a physical therapist, having worked with older adults and aging adults for over 17 years, I've you know really started to identify what are the questions that we need to ask to determine is someone safe for staying at home? So whether it's for yourself or a loved one that you may be caring for, it's important to ask, you know, are we seeing that that limitation in cognition is affecting activities of daily living? Now, that's just a really fancy way to say, can they do the things during the day that they need to be able to do? Get dressed, take a shower, prepare a meal, balance a checkbook or pay bills, uh, go out and go grocery shopping or order groceries in, in today's world. Um, you know, understanding, can we do all of those things that we need to so that our daily routine is maintained and the safety of our daily routine is maintained? The other important question, and Rob touched upon this a little bit, is understanding, do we even, are we aware of our own limitations or is my loved one aware of their limitations? Because that's a really significant difference. If someone is aware and they know, hey, wow, all of a sudden I've been having a little bit more trouble with my memory, they're gonna be more likely to ask for help or to utilize strategies to help maintain their ability to do things. For those of us that aren't aware, of our deficits, or maybe are seeing that our loved ones aren't aware of their deficits, this is a much riskier situation because that person doesn't even know that they're having problems with certain tasks. So therefore, they don't know that they should ask for some help on them. 
Uh, third question, are there medical issues that predispose my loved one for a fall in the home? So we talked briefly on the last slide that falls are one of the main reasons why someone has to seek additional care, whether it's in the home or in some type of a facility because falls can lead to a variety of serious injuries, whether it's broken bones, head injuries, um, or any other type of serious fracture or injury. So we wanna make sure that there aren't other issues that might predispose someone to have a fall. So maybe it's balance problems, maybe it's uh, something like a stroke that's affected a side of their body and they're not able to safely move around. Uh, maybe it's limited strength or endurance that might cause them to trip on the stairs or have a trouble uh, performing the stairs. So there's a variety of different medical issues that might predispose someone to be more at risk for falling. And then lastly, is there help available? And we'll talk about this as we go through the rest of the presentation, but we understand, um, you know, both Rob and I having done this job for so long that you may not be the right person to care for your loved one because you have a job or you have kids of your own or you have, you know, you, you're trying to travel for your retirement, whatever the case may be. Um, and it may be that you're not the one to provide that care, but maybe there's some other way that care could be provided so that help is available. Um, and then if it is available, is your loved one willing to access that? And we'll talk about some strategies through the rest of this presentation to provide the funding as well as the access so that help is available and um, ready for your loved one or yourself if you happen to need it. Oh, Rob, hang on, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so what are the tools that we have for advocacy? Um, you know, first and foremost, the, the power of attorney is the, is the tool of choice. Uh, it's so important because the power of attorney can avoid so much inconvenience, cost, and uh, potentially conflict, although conflict is something that you can't always avoid. Uh, but what is a power of attorney? In its simplest form, a power of attorney is a written document where you appoint someone who you give the authorities that are written in the document. So you can't say as a general item or as a general uh, uh, concept what a power of attorney authorizes because every power of attorney is drafted differently. When does a power of attorney become effective? This is normally when I have more time to discuss, I, I always like to ask the audience this question, but today, since it's limited, I will give you the answer. A power of attorney, well, actually, I should say first, before I get into any of it, there's two words that you learn the second day of law school. And those two words are, it depends, meaning that everything that I will discuss with you depends on the facts of the certain, uh, you know, the family situation. But a power of attorney can be either a springing power of attorney where there's a condition in it that says, uh, this cannot be used until um, I am incapacitated. And every power of attorney that has this springing provision is gonna have a different standard and it's gonna be viewed differently by a financial institution. Um, most powers of attorney are immediately uh, available to be used. So there is no condition and once they are executed, they are, can be um, used immediately by the, the person who you have named as your agent under that power of attorney. That is preferable to me as a lawyer, because to me, anytime you put a roadblock in front of the person that you trust, hopefully, and that you have appointed to make decisions for you, you are creating problems and you're doing exactly what the POA is there to avoid. The POA is there to give someone the ability to help you is to allow a continuity of decision making and not to have delays. And when you have a springing provision in there with a condition precedent to, um, to them being allowed to act for you, you're doing exactly what you executed the power of attorney to avoid. So um, I am very much not a fan of springing powers of attorney. What is a guardianship? Whereas a power of attorney is something that you draft or your attorney drafts and you can define what authorities are in it and you can choose who your agent is, a guardianship is a legal process. And this is a process where someone uh, has to institute a, um, uh, a legal proceeding to determine A, whether you're incapacitated under the law and B, the appropriate guardian. Um, I apologize for the facts in the background. Can't uh, can't uh, deal with it right now. But um, so when you're looking at a guardianship, you've got to ask why you need one, because the law says we always want to use the least restrictive alternative. 
a power of attorney is usually a less restrictive alternative unless the individual no longer has the ability to understand what they're signing or because of behavioral issues due to dementia or other cognitive impairment. They simply won't sign it or will revoke it at an inconvenient time when it would harm them to do so. So guardianships are used as a last resort, but sometimes they're a necessity when you have a person who either due to advanced cognitive impairment or lack of ability to cooperate with you needs that advocacy and the court needs to be involved. The thing about it is though, it's more expensive. A lawyer is required. Um, you know, the, the court may or may not choose the person you would want to choose. And there are restrictions about what a guardian can do. So ideally, when we're looking at guardianship versus power of attorney, the power of attorney is always going to be prefer the preferred tool if it's an appropriate tool, meaning that the person who is signing the power of attorney understands what they're signing, has the capacity to do that, and will in fact cooperate. Because if they're not going to cooperate with the person that they name as agent, the power of attorney is going to be a useless document. And then a guardianship is going to be necessary so that somebody can forcefully get in there and prevent harm from happening to the older or cognitively impaired individual. So which is better? Um, in most cases, the power of attorney thoughtfully, comprehensively drafted is the better option. Fantastic. And really why that issue becomes so important is that we need to understand when someone needs to step in. And oftentimes that comes to fruition or that topic comes up when we start to see that someone can't live independently and they're not safe to stay on their own. And there's a variety of different reasons why someone may not be able to live independently any longer. So on this slide, I kind of use this as that little checkoff sheet because these are very difficult um, decisions to make, they're, they're difficult conversations. Um, and oftentimes they rely on input from a professional like myself or Rob that can help to guide those family decisions because they're not the easiest conversations to have, particularly if you're managing a loved one that doesn't have the insight to know that there's an issue. So some of these signs, we've talked about falling already, certainly given the rate of injury and risk of injury, falling is something that we need to be wary of. So if you have a loved one or yourself, you start noticing that you're having difficulty with losing your balance, or maybe you've had a couple falls, these are some signs that we need to get some steps put in place. Now, certainly that doesn't mean we have to rush right into getting help in the home or moving to a facility. That's where something like physical therapy to help remedy that situation would come in. But we wanna just be mindful that if someone is having falls or at risk for falls, that we've gotta start being very proactive. Difficulty managing finances, and, and Rob touched upon this both from a, a scam perspective, but then also just from a high level skill perspective paying bills, uh, managing a, a um, checkbook, um, making sure that you have enough for your daily expenses. These are all significantly higher level skills than we give ourselves credit for. And one of the things that we'll notice in early decline is an inability to manage finances. So whether that means making extraneous donations to scam uh, charities that are trying to just get money from older adults, um, or just the inability for someone to pay their bills on time um, or you know, pay their premiums for their insurance on time. These are things that would be a good red flag that we've got to look at uh, management. Um, increased challenges with community tasks. So this could be you know, maybe going grocery shopping, it could be taking your car to the dealer to get repaired, um, you running out to do errands, doctor's appointments. So things that require kind of that multi-step process. Maybe it's calling to make an appointment, getting in the car, navigating there, and then executing the task, and then finding your way back home. Um, these are some definite um, skills that, again, we uh, undervalue how difficult that is to put all of those pieces together. Someone who is demonstrating cognitive decline will likely have trouble making those complex tasks happen. Um, increases in car accidents, and certainly I don't necessarily mean, you know, very destructive multi-vehicle fatality type car accidents. This could be just as little as, you know, bumping into the side of the garage when you're pulling in, or maybe it's, you know, backing into the mailbox. Um, maybe it's not remembering where you parked your car when you come out of the grocery store. That's not necessarily a vehicle accident, but it is hindering the ability to operate that vehicle safely. Um, so these are things that we really have to be mindful of um, in our older adults, um, just to be careful that it doesn't lead towards a fatality style accident or one that can cause some massive destruction. 
Spoiled food in the refrigerator. Um, oftentimes as we get older, we lose our ability to smell um, or it at least becomes significantly reduced. And one of the odors that can become difficult to perceive is that of rotten food. Um, I experienced this myself with my own grandfather as I helped caregive him through his years of Alzheimer's. And I would go over to his house every day for dinner, or I'm sorry, every week for dinner. And I would check the fridge to make sure that there wasn't rotten meat or you know spoiled food, lunch meat that had gone bad um, because he wasn't able to smell and perceive if something wasn't safe for eating. Um, victims of fraud, we've touched upon this already. Um, other two um, key in, uh, signs that someone shouldn't be living by their own um, accord is if they're having trouble with hygiene. So maybe you're noticing that they're not showering as regularly. Um, often there may be an odor associated with that. Maybe it's not shaving. Um, it could be hygiene within the bathroom. You notice that the toilet isn't clean or that the um, there's things around that shouldn't be. Um, and it comes down to cleanliness. Um, so these are things that maybe it's just a matter of having a housekeeper come in once a week or once a month to help tidy up. And then the last one is paranoia. Paranoia is one of the signs of later stage Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it is something that we need to be wary of because that paranoia um, while typically directed at family, can also span um, to other providers like healthcare providers, it could be building contractors, it could be um, car dealer uh, repair, car repair uh, folks, bankers. Um, so we want to just be mindful that if we see signs of paranoia where people are really worried about, you know, their money being stolen or you're taking things from me or you're going to break into my house, uh, symptoms of paranoia are uh, very significant because they do hinder that ability to do daily tasks. Um, you know, you, just to follow up on that, as I was mentioning earlier, the paranoia uh, with regard to financial exploitation, though, can actually be a safety tool since they lack the ability at that point to, um, they're, they're often questioning not only the, their loved ones and their providers, but also the strangers who call them on the phone who try to manipulate them into writing checks. But unfortunately, at the beginning stages of cognitive impairment, they don't understand that because they, they have lost a certain ability but don't recognize it. How do we pay for this? You know, long-term care, 75% of us, all the studies say, at some point in our life are going to need it. So there's really two options. There's private pay. And private pay is exactly sounds like what it is. Um, it is um, paying cash, re reducing your assets, spending your money down, or... For those few people who have long-term care insurance, that's part of the private pay uh, continuum. Um, the, 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 the bulk of people that I deal with today don't have it. Many have, uh, who used to have it, there, many more people used to buy it 20 and 30 years ago when it was a, a relatively newer option. Back then it was a better value. Today, the cost of long-term care insurance is extraordinarily high. And I've just been having this conversation with my father-in-law because he was hit with two, not one, but two massive increases in premiums in the last um, in the last two years. Interestingly, I don't think in Pennsylvania, our insurance department would allow the increases. But in Florida, where he lives, apparently the insurance department is allowing it. And he was hit with two increases of very significant percentages on his long-term care insurance policy and is having to reduce the amount of coverage. So you're either going to pay and different types of care allow different pay. So for home care, depending upon your finances, there are only private pay options, or some people may be eligible for the Medicaid waiver program, which is a long discussion in and of itself. But Medicaid is one of the options I'll discuss in a second. For personal care and assisted living in Pennsylvania, the only way to get that is through private funds. They do not accept Medicaid or Medicare or any other funding sources that are not out of your own pocket or through a long-term care policy. Um, nursing home is either Medicare, private pay, or Medicaid, and now we'll talk about what those are. So people often have the misunderstanding that Medicare is going to pay for long-term care. It does not. Medicare can, for short-term rehabilitation, pay for the bulk of your costs if you're going to a nursing home to be rehabbed so that you will um, be able to leave and become independent. Medicare will only pay for the first 20 days of rehabilitation. And if you qualify, uh, they will pay for a portion of the next 80, but there will be a 170 plus dollar a day copay, which normally your um, Part B supplement will cover, but not all will. 
So Medicare is not a source of funds for long-term care payments. If you need to be in a nursing home because you're frail or older and need, just need assistance with activities of daily living, Medicare is not gonna pay for that. Um, the Veterans Administration can assist in some circumstances. If you are in a nursing home, the VA is likely gonna end up not providing much help. If you are in the community, and when I say the community, I mean at home, or if you are in a personal care home, the Veterans Administration, depending upon your finances, may have some help that you can get. They will never, however, pay the full cost of uh, personal care. So if you uh, need assistance in the home and you need 24 hour care or you need 10 hours a day, the VA is not gonna help you that much, but they might give you up to like $1,800 a month uh, if you're a, a, a veteran um, who qualifies financially. And that could be a substantial amount of help. But if you don't have, if you need 10 to 12 hours a day and have no other sources of payment, then the VA will not be enough to keep you safely in the home. Um, the biggest payer of long-term care services in this country is Medicaid. In Pennsylvania, Medicaid is called medical assistance. Medicaid is paying for approximately 60 plus percent of current residents of nursing homes in our state and across the country. Medicaid is a means-tested program, which means that uh, if you get Medicaid, it, you have spent your resources, you have very limited financial resources. Now, that doesn't mean that you, if you are married, you need to spend everything you have to get Medicaid. One of the things that I spend a lot of my time helping clients with is that um, if there is a, a couple who is married, I can help them protect a lot more in the way of financial resources than they could if they didn't come to me or another capable elder law attorney. So one of the things that elder law attorneys do is we help you maximize your financial resources so that you do not spend every single last penny before you can get Medicaid. And Medicaid is primarily for nursing home, but if you meet the uh, financial qualifications, Medicaid will pay for a limited amount of assistance in the home. So if you have potentially VA resources available and you're qualified for the Medicaid waiver program in the home, you may be able to actually get enough help to get to keep you almost with 24 hour care. But generally the difference between Medicaid in a nursing home and Medicaid in the waiver program, which will provide home and community-based services is that you will not get 24 hour care in the home from Medicaid. So really the best answer is let's keep you in your home safely because we wanna to try to avoid all of these extraordinary costs of having to provide care. Um, as well as you know the the risk of having to spend down resources that you've worked hard your whole life to build um, in order to qualify for something like medical assistance. And you know we've talked about some of those signs for what are the the signs that you shouldn't be living at home or your loved one shouldn't be living at home. And we talked about how false is one of those main reasons. And one of the things I like to give in this presentation is just some really actionable tips to help improve the safety around your home or your loved one's homes to help minimize that risk for falls, since we know that that can be one of the major A, causes of mortality and B, causes for um, need for assistance in the home. So the first is remove throw, throw rugs, nice and easy. Um, certainly the two places where I see these most problematic are entering in and out of the home, as well as throw rugs in the bathroom. So like the little shower rug or the one right in front of the sink or, or toilet. If you are the type of person like my mother is who insists on having rugs, then just um, get yourself that double-sided tape, put it between the floor and the rugs. It won't ruin the floors, but what it does is it keeps that rug fixed down to the floor so that it doesn't get tangled up underneath your feet as you're walking in and out of the home. This is especially more pertinent if you have something like a walker or a cane or have some issues with your balance. So we wanna to try to minimize anything getting tangled up under your feet and throw rugs can be one of those things. Install a nightlight in your bedroom. Um, if you are a very light sensitive person and you're like, there's no way I can sleep with a nightlight, they make motion active nightlights. Um, this plugs right into your outlet when the um, nightlight senses that you're getting out of bed to go to the bathroom maybe in the middle of the night or to you know go get the dog who you know is scratching at the door after you've been sleeping. Uh, you know, that will turn the light on so that as you come up into standing to go to the restroom, you're not disoriented and your body isn't trying to figure out your balance. One of the number one falls that occurs at 
nighttime is when people get up in the middle of the night and it's pitch black and they try to go to the bathroom. So having that motion activated nightlight or having a nightlight in the bathroom is a great way to prevent that from happening. Grab bars in the shower and near the toilet. Um, there are some really cosmetic versions of grab bars now that do not require fixating them into the beautiful tile of your of your um, bathroom. Um, I know that's a big issue for a lot of people is, you know, holy cow, I just got this beautiful house in my new 55 plus community. I don't want to put all these medical grab bars. They make some really cosmetic ones that are actually very firm suction cup that are stable enough for a, a full-size person to hold on to. I know we utilized that when my grandmother was living with my parents. Um, and certainly it's a nice option to have, especially going in and out of the shower um, because the floor is wet. And even if you don't have a problem with balance, it's a great spot for just an accident to happen. So having something to hold on to that's not a towel rack that could easily fall off, something that's sturdy is a great option. Uh, maintaining clear pathways. And when you think about those clear pathways, you want to think about where are the areas that I travel most during the day. Um, you know, certainly in my mind, I think there should be a clear pathway from the bed to the bathroom so that at night, if it is dark, you're not tripping over slippers. Um, and then, you know, clear pathways in the main parts of the house, you know, in the kitchen, in the hallways, so that certainly things aren't getting tangled up under your feet when you're walking. Um, that also goes for animals and pets. So being mindful that if you have a pet in the home, they can often become a source of tripping. So kind of having a good strategy for managing uh, your pet at night or maybe your pet on the stairs. I've treated numerous patients uh, that fell down the steps because a pet got tangled up under their feet while they were trying to come down the stairs. So just being mindful of that and having a good strategy for controlling that. Um, always throw your cell phone in your pocket. If you are someone who has had a history of falls or maybe your loved one has had a history of falls, you can get a pendulum um, or a, a pendant that holds your cell phone so that you can wear it with you. Um, you can wear it in a belt clip on your hip. You can put it in your pocket. You can get a cute little crossbody purse. That's just a really little one. That's the size of your phone. So that if you do have problems with your balance um, and you have a fall, you're not laying on the floor for days waiting for someone to find you. Um, I've had, again, several patients that had a fall in the home. They weren't able to reach up to the countertop to get their house phone um, or their cell phone was up on the kitchen counter and they couldn't get up there because of the pain from the fall. And for days, they stayed on the floor waiting for someone to notice that they weren't available or around. So having that cell phone in your pocket or at worst case scenario, just making sure that when you place your phone down in your home, if it is a cell phone, keep it on the coffee table or a lower table. So it's something that you could reach from the floor if God forbid you did have an emergency. Uses, use of a device, so whether that's a cane or a walker, certainly as a physical therapist, I recognize that this is not the option that most people want to go towards. So I work with my patients to try to prevent that from happening if they're not looking for using a device. Um, however, in some situations, it is a really fantastic option to enable that independent living within the home. And then it's my job to work with you to find the device that fits your needs, meets your cosmetic requirements, as well as your safety requirements. And then last thing, little plug for PT. Um, certainly um, one of the areas that our office loves to work with is balance remediation. Many people think that as part of normally growing old, they're going to start to lose their balance and that's just something they have to deal with. I couldn't disagree more. Uh, balance can be remediated at any age, whether you're in your 20s or in your 100s. Um, and our ability to train your body to be better balanced and safer is very, very good. Um, so it requires, unfortunately, the skill of a trained professional because we can't have you doing things at home that are going to challenge your balance if you're at risk for falls because then you could have a fall at home. So it certainly does require a skilled professional to guide you through those exercises and activities. Um, but we've seen very, very dramatic improvements um, in all ages on people's ability to stay safely in their home because of improved balance. So certainly, you know, Rob and I, before we open it up for questions, just want to reiterate that, you know, addressing cognitive decline early is really the best way to prevent an issue. And if nothing else, it starts that conversation so that you aren't waiting until things get so far down the path and so far out of control that now you have to act on it on um, in a panic mode. We want to start that um, conversation early with the professionals that are necessary to be a part of it, like Rob, like myself, so that we can help to triage those problems and keep 
uh, keep you or keep your loved ones in your home longer for as long as possible. There are tons of resources available to help you with the support that you need, um, whether it's for you or a loved one. And this is where Rob and I wanna encourage you to reach out. Even if you don't need either of our services, reach out with your questions because we can help point you in the direction of someone who can help. Um, this is a difficult topic to navigate. And we recognize having been through this so many times with our, our, our own clients that help is necessary. And we want to be those people to help provide you with that help. Um, with that, I'm going to show the last slide here, which does have mine and Rob's contact information on it. Um, as a thank you from me, uh, if you'd like to download my top exercises to promote healthy aging, uh, that's available here at reachyours.com backslash healthy aging. Also, my email and phone number are here for any questions. And then you'll see here for Rob uh, links to set up uh, Zoom consultations, phone number, website, we encourage you to just take a look at our websites and, and familiarize yourself with the services we offer in the event that you do need them or need to refer them to someone else. Uh, with that, I am going to take this off of screen share. We certainly will um, happily send you our contact information afterwards so that you have that, but I'm gonna take it off of screen share so that we can go to a little bit more cozy of a forum in the event that anybody has any questions. So at this point, if you have any questions, you're welcome to unmute yourself and throw those questions at us. I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a question. Can you hear Great. me? Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Um, first of all, I have two questions. First is, it was not that clear to me. I guess I didn't understand it well. The, the, the line between power of attorney and guardianship in terms of, uh, what can one do and what the other one can't do? Well, power of attorney is something you choose, you draft. I mean, you have your uh -huh. lawyer draft. So you can put in as many or as few uh, types of authority as okay. you want. And it could be medical or financial. A guardianship is driven by statutory law. So when you get a guardian appointed, you are restricted to what the statute allows a guardianship okay. to do. Uh, the guardian to do. And also, you're also required to have court approval in certain circumstances. So the, the, the power of attorney is by far the more flexible tool. And we only use guardianships as a last resort when a power of attorney is impractical for any number of reasons. Okay. May, may I have another question to ask you? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> with regard to, <clears throat> excuse me, my wife has an IRA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's considerable in the sense that we're, we're paying for somebody to come in Monday to Friday now from 11 to 4.30. So does the IRA have to be used up before she can go into a nursing home and not pay? So we don't have to pay uh, out of well, our own, like my money, for example, wouldn't have to pay for it. Well, first of all, um, yes. I mean, for her to qualify, and I don't know anything about your personal finances. Right. <clears throat> But for her to qualify for Medicaid to pay for the nursing home, we would have to do a spend down plan. Um, depending upon what her other monthly income is, excluding the IRA, if she has a pension or social security, she'd only be able to keep other than excluded resources, which we can make pretty large, mm -hmm. um, but she would only be able to keep either $2,400 in her name or 8,000. So if she has a $300,000 IRA, that would have to be liquidated. It doesn't necessarily have to be spent. We can work a, a, a plan out to reconfigure it. That also would apply to waiver services. So understand that if you said, look, we want to keep our home as long as possible, but we've made a decision that we want to, um, we want to apply for medical assistance for home and community-based services, then we could consider that if her income is low enough. The one major difference between getting nursing home services through Medicaid and having home and community based is in the nursing home, there is no uh, maximum income. In the, in the community, if you're seeking waiver, there is a maximum income of around $2,400 a month. So if you make more than that, there's a technical cap on that. I have been able to get around that cap if you're just a few hundred over. But if someone is making 5,000 a month, you're gonna, you will not get Medicaid to pay for home and community based services. So this is a uh, a very fact specific conversation, but uh, the answer is she can only have a very small amount in her name, excluding protected resources that I can protect for the spouse uh, before she would be eligible for Medicaid. 
Okay, thank you. That was a very helpful answer. Any other questions? You are welcome to unmute. And certainly if it's a specific question uh, regarding your own personal finances or finances of a loved one, or maybe it's about, you know, the safety of someone in the home, that's where you can reach out to Rob and I individually and we can talk through the specific nuances of your situation. But certainly if there's any general questions out there on the topic, feel free to throw them out there. Okay, can I get out there? Yes, please, go ahead. Okay, uh, my husband and I are in our mid eighties and our daughter and son-in-law are planning on moving to Maine and would like us to move with them. We would like to stay here and possibly go and probably go into an assisted living facility. I strongly feel you still need <coughs> advocates, even though you're in an assisted living facility and my husband doesn't think that's necessary. So I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. You need still need what? Advocates, even though you're in the advocates, family around, even though you're in an assisted living facility. I agree with your husband 100%. I mean, with you 100%, you both need advocates. You need proper powers of attorney and you need a support system. Yes. Okay. And I will, I will say one of the things um, to keep in mind is that that advocate may not necessarily need to be a family member. So advocates to me are someone that's going to help you with decision making, provide resources, help you guide your choices. If you are sound of mind and have a family that's accessible, you know, even if they're out of state, it could be someone that provides you with the information that you then can have that conversation to decide on. So I agree, advocates are absolutely necessary and coming up with who that person is and that I, I consider it more of a team of people, um, who that team is, is really the most important part of it. Okay, thank you. Great question. What else? Mm -hmm. Could you repeat that? Uh reachyours.com. I wasn't able to get it all. Uh, Absolutely. So the URL is reachyours.com slash healthy aging. Healthy aging. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And we'll certainly send a um, follow-up email to anyone interested with that information, as well as mine and Rob's contact. We'll send that um, to the email that you registered with. So that way everybody can have it afterwards, but thank you for asking. What other questions are out there? I don't have a question. Okay, um, anyone else? Question? Um, yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, I have two sons and a daughter in the middle. Um, my daughter lives close by and she is a lawyer. She's a Penn, Penn grad. Um, she's vice president of a company in Great Valley. She has identical twin boys who are five, and she has a daughter who's about to be eight. But she is the only person that I would trust with our guardianship or um, POA. She already has power of attorney for us. But she is so overwhelmed with her own family and life that I hate to put any burden on her. Um, we don't need it right now, but my husband is 83 and he um, he's 10 years older than I am. And I can see that, um, I can see a lot of this decline in, in him um, gradually. Uh, so I'm, I'm very concerned. We live, uh, we live in Malvern in, a, in Tidewater which is a very nice community and everything's taken care of outside. But, uh, you know, every day there's something, there's something that is showing me that there's cognitive impairment. Well, so th there's some of your issues. First of all, um, if you, you know, you can always have a power of attorney that names more than one person so mm -hmm. that either could help you depending mm -hmm. on the circumstances. So yes. there's no reason if you're, if you trust your daughter's judgment, but you feel that her, her plate is very full right now that you can't appoint her and another friend, family member, clergyman, somebody you trust. Okay. So that's one issue. The second issue that you just mentioned was that you have questions about your husband's cognition. So the question is, 
does he have the, the requisite capacity necessary to execute a power of attorney? I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. But clearly, any good attorney who's going to uh, be willing to, to help you uh, prepare documents is going to want to be clear that the people who are signing them understand what they're signing. Okay. So I think you've got two separate issues. One is, it sounds like you need to find an additional person that can work with your daughter so that she is not overwhelmed by your potential caregiving needs. Mm -hmm. And then you also need to probably have your husband cognitively assessed to determine whether he's in a position to be executing new documents of any sort. Okay. And I will say one additional thing to consider here is, and this is where I know it can be very difficult with that sensation of not wanting to put burden on someone else, but I also really advocate for my clients to open up that conversation line. So I would highly recommend broach the topic with your daughter and say, hey, listen, I have some concerns about your dad or, or my husband's cognition. I know there's going to be a lot of things coming up and I know you have a lot on your plate. How do you feel about this? And how do you want us to go about it? Do you think it would be helpful to have another person as a POA? Because she may say, well, gosh, mom, I, you're my priority and I, I would drop everything for you. Or she may say, hey, you're right, mom. Thanks for being really aware of what's going on in my life. And yes, let's find you know one of my brothers or someone else to help out. I think what happens is oftentimes we um, negate the conversation because we worry that that's going to be one more stress to put on. And mm -hmm. I would really encourage you to have it and ask her, hey, how are you feeling about this? Do you feel like this is too much to handle? Um, and it will really go a long way with you guys pro building a plan to move forward. Yes. Okay. It's Great. funny. Also, this whole election thing was so upsetting to our whole family because my husband is very conservative and our children are very liberal. This, this they don't realize that they're going to have to pay for all this stuff that they, you know, I mean, it's not going to fall from the sky. It's well, We're going to curtail a political conversation online at this point. However, I certainly appreciate how that can lead to um, definite family dynamics. So certainly yes. worth, worth looking into, um, but we'll, we'll curtail that on this platform, but I certainly appreciate how that would play a role. Yeah, and that, so, you know, my husband has always preferred our daughter to, you know, to, we could always count on her, but there's been some, you know, <laughs> some stuff going on that, you know, he, uh, He's fed up with the kids that they don't realize, you know, what they've done. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Any other questions and out there? What is my <laughs> yes, you're right. Any other questions out there? Wonderful. I really appreciate this time shared together today. Rob and Heather, thank you so much for joining us on this topic. This is always a, such a rewarding conversation. Um, and I do want to extend a very special thank you out to everyone who joined us today. Um, certainly, we will follow up so that you have our contact information in the event that there's any questions um, and really look forward to hopefully meeting next time in person. All you Heather Skirties out there, I can't wait to meet you. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us today and uh, certainly reach out if there's any other questions. Have a nice day. And a nice thank you. Weekend. Thank you. And I will follow up with an email and it also has a link for a free exercise program with Action Potential one-on-one -on -one therapy that Kristen has provided for you to do a little exercise during COVID for there recovery. Thank you so much. And we also have a Getting Your Affairs in Order presentation that I will send information about as well. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.